Okay. Uh, this is the Tracker and Android Country Stories session at this point, uh, where we really wanted to, to give everybody a chance to hear from some of the various uh, types of implementations that are using Tracker, using Android, using both. Um, so we're very lucky to be able to have uh, presenting to us uh, uh, presenters from three different projects. Uh, we will hear from a project uh, in Nigeria, and then Kenya, and then Ghana. Uh, but we would start first uh, with Isaiah speaking to us about the Adolescence 360 project in Nigeria, if uh, Isaiah is on and has been given a chance to share his screen. Hi, everyone. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Max, thanks. Great. So I'm going straight to share my screen. Right. Yeah, so I hope you can see my screen. Hi everyone, my name is Isaiah Nyabuto. I'm a DHS2 specialist. Uh, I work for PSI, Population Services International. And today I'm going to talk about the Adolescent 360 project in Nigeria and how we deploy the DHIS2 Android at scale for client mobilization and provision of services in the public health sector. So I'll start by a brief, a very brief introduction to the A360 project, the Adolescent 360. I'll then move on to the key aspects before and during the integration of the DHIS2 apps. I'll show you our key results. And then lastly, I will close with the lessons learned. So let's get started. Um, the Adolescent 360 project aims to raise the uptake of modern contraceptives among young adolescent girls of age 15 to 19 years. The project implements two main health interventions. One, the Niger program, which is implemented in the southern parts of Nigeria. So the small circles in orange in the map. And Niger targets the unmarried girls with some specific forums to gain skills and knowledge about their health. The other key program is Matasa Matan Arewa, which is commonly known as the MMA. The MMA is implemented in the northern parts of Nigeria. So the small uh, circles in the map in the northern part. So the small circles in green in the map. And MMA targets the married girls and husbands through the maternal and child health program. A360 is active in 206 public facilities across eight states. And the project is co-funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children Investment Fund Foundation, CIF. So to my next point, uh, the key aspects. So before DHIS2 and capture apps, the client mobilization, uh, the client and service the client mobilization reports are being recorded on paper-based forms. Yes, which were then uh, compiled into regional spreadsheets and then uploaded into an online shared files for easy access. So this approach presented several challenges and uh, despite the many attempts by the team to improve timeliness and other quality standards, data quality remained a huge challenge. The A360 core team wanted to streamline their data flows to improve the timeliness of reporting and also benefit from more advanced analytics and data visualization functionalities in DHIS2. So during our integration, we first did an initial assessment of the project setting. This happened in February and March, 2019. Then, Together with uh, the Society for Family Health, SFH in Nigeria, 
we co-designed modules for client mobilization and service provision in DHIS2. We also trained 15 regional teams and about 600 field staff on the mobile data capture. All this happened between April and May 2019. And then the team went on a pilot phase uh, sometime in June through August 2019, uh, followed up by a scale-up phase, uh, scale phase uh, in September, uh, all through December 2019. One of the key results that uh, we had through this project was streamlined data flow. So the field staff uh, so the Niger girls and the MME mobilizers could then like, record the uh, client mobilization and submit live reports using the DHIS2 apps. The providers uh, also could record the client visits in paper forms with some help from the young designers uh, based in the clinics who then verify and report using the DHIS2 and capture apps. So yeah, this is this is uh, how the their current data flow their current data flow um, is, and the program assistants together with the regional managers they also verify and validate data in DHIS2. Another key result was improved efficiency. Sometime in in 2019, an average of 661 client mobilization and uh, 8,526 service reports were completed monthly. What this means, 33 mobilization and 426 service reports were being completed on daily basis, all through the DHIS2 and it capture apps. Another key result was uh, improved data quality and data use, evidenced by the timely completed and verified reports in DHIS2 and uh, continuous program implementation and adaptation of the project. So here we thanks to the DHIS2 analytics and dashboards. And uh, this is one of the outputs the program team sees on a day-to-day -day basis. It shows the total adopters conversion rate by state and number of clinic. In green are the conversion rates while the small circles in pink indicate the adopters, the number of adopters reported from the clinics. So green indicates a good sign, which is a, a good performance, while in pink, the volume. Uh, so the bigger the size uh, of the circle is also the bigger the, the volume of the adopters coming from the clinics. So, and also notice, um, the high number of adopters coming from the south uh, west part of Nigeria, where the Niger Girls program is mainly implemented. So the program team sees this, and uh, uh, through this and other charts on the dashboards, they can be able to uh, identify the areas with more saturations and also plan for their next uh, move. On the key results, so sorry, on the lessons learned. We encountered some specific challenges. Number one is an uh, issue to do with data synchronization seen in DHIS 2.3. And uh, with this, uh, we were able to fix uh, by an upgrade to the next release of the DHIS 2 apps. Another key challenge is connectivity issues in some states which we also managed to fix uh, by limiting access, the internet access on the mobile devices. Among the, sorry, just a minute. Among the enabling devices, uh, the enabling factors were the initial assessment of the project setting. Uh, yes, the one that we did in February. This helped us to appropriately design the tools in DHIS2. Another key enabling factor is the active involvement of the program uh, staff from the design phase to the development and testing phases. Last but not least is the introduction of a mobile device management solution, MDM, 
which helped us take control over the devices, including managing of uh, internet access and software updates. For more information about uh, this project, uh, please join our discussions uh, in the DHS2 community of practice. You can also download a full report, uh, also available in the community of practice and in the link in this presentation. And you can also contact me uh, on the email address right there. So at this point, uh, I would like to welcome any questions um, from the team and also check through uh, our page on the community of practice if there are any. Thanks. Great. And so we, we made sure to save a couple of minutes of questions uh, live for these country sessions. So we'll, we'll try to get to a couple of them, at least that have been coming through online. Uh, one of the questions was about the transmission link mapping, uh, supporting links between TEIs, enrollments, and events in the different programs. This was coming from uh, Kala Hedberg. Is there anything, Isaiah, that you could say about the links between the TEIs, enrollments, and events? Yeah, so I'll uh, talk briefly about the, our current setup. So our current setup follows a series of single events. Uh, so we are using the single events, um, which uh, they don't have any like, registrations. So we, we are not following any, uh, or we are not implementing any tracked entity instance, uh, that is. Okay, great. Uh, Marta, I think you identified one about support. Yes, I think it's very interesting, this question. Is there, um, do we have a question that says, how did you address the support for mobile users? As we all know, the DHS to mobile app cannot use tools like TeamViewer to go through the user issue. So remote support, how did you manage for remote, remote support? Yeah, so, um, so first is that we did have a team in Nigeria uh, who also uh, who could closely help us uh, especially uh, yes during the first stage in implementing the uh, devices so sorry in 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 setting up the devices but then also we implemented the MDM uh, devices so this is a scale fusion uh, type of uh, service that we we are using in Nigeria so through this uh, platform we can be able to send any updates uh, to the mobile devices, um, yes, directly. So it's it's all about the MDM solution, and then uh, some support that also we receive uh, from the regional teams uh, in the field. Right, and then maybe maybe just one more. And I know that there's interest in the MDM tool, which was just mentioned. So again, in the community of practice thread, perhaps ask some questions there, and we can get some more details. But but this question was about uh, motivation and incentives of the field staff. How do you manage and maintain the levels of motivation and incentive for the data collection? So uh, yeah, this question is mainly a program uh, is mainly a program question. So uh, yes, but what I'm aware of is that in Nigeria, uh, yes, there is currently an an incentive mechanism uh, through which the mobilizers are motivated. So uh, based on the number of the clients that they're able to reach and uh, yeah, and uh, also the number of reports that they submit in DHIS too. So yeah, this is uh, more of a program uh, uh, aspect of the project. Uh, yes, but mainly, yes, there is that aspect of uh, motivation in the field. Okay, thank you, Isaiah. I think we can leave it there unless, is there any other question you wanna bring up now, Mike? That you found no, interesting? I think, no, I think just uh, please bring things over to the community of practice. We'll have a lot more time there to answer questions, but then otherwise I think we're ready for the next. Okay, I, I wanna address one because it's a very simple one and it's not related to the project. So thank you, Isaiah. Thank you again and congratulations on the great work. Uh, this question says, any update on DHS to Android on data entry offline mode and data synchronization? So th that's what the data, that's what the Android app does. Offline data entry and synchronization. So just to clarify in case it was not clear. And we are seeing here an example uh, presented by Isaiah. So thank you, Isaiah. I think it's time to move uh, to the next 
presentation. So we are going to have Beatriz Akeyo uh, presenting us the Afia Uzazi project, uh, which is focusing on monitoring uh, the increase of fourth antenatal care attendance, skilled birth attendance, and postnatal care attendance. And the project is based in Kenya. So Beatriz, uh, whenever you are ready, you can present. And thank you. Beatriz, just so that you are muted. I don't know if you're if you already started. We can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Mata and uh, uh, the team. So my name is Beatriz Akeo. I am a um, data manager and information system specialist at uh, FHI 360 at Yozazi. I'm very happy to be presenting to you today on the topic of uh, how we are using um, DHIS 200 app for rapid result information gathering for monitoring to increase fourth NC uh, attendance, give birth attendance and PNC attendance. So uh, we are going to go through the topics of uh, Afia Uzazi project intro. We are going to look at our implementation coverage, uh, our system architecture results and next steps. So I'll give a little introduction about our project, Afiozazi. So Afiozazi is a USID funded five year project that runs from uh, October 2016 to September 2021. And it is a consortium of two, two organizations that is FHI 360 and Gold Star Kenya. And it aims to increase family planning, reproductive, maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health impact increasing access to and uh, demand for these healthcare services in the project coverage areas. So the project coverage areas consist of two counties in Kenya, that is Nakuru County and Baringo County. And in Nakuru County, we operate in two sub-counties, that is Kuresoi North and Kuresoi South sub-counties. And that is where we started to implement the uh, DHIS2 Android data capture. In Baringo County, we operate in four sub-counties. That is Baringo Central, Baringo North, Marigat, and Mogotio. So uh, within the implementation coverage, I'll start by giving a little background on uh, uh, the reasons why we, we implemented the Android uh, Data Capture app to collect data. So uh, through the implementation of our pro project, uh, what we noted in uh, our implementation coverage areas is that most of the pregnant women are attending first NC visits, but um, are still finding it a challenge to complete four NC visits as recommended by WHO to deliver at a health facility and also to uh, access PNC healthcare services within three days of delivery. So we can see there that in 2018, only 49% of the pregnant women completed four ANC visits, 65% uh, delivered at a hospital, and only 21% accessed PNC services within three days after delivery. So in Kuresoi South, um, we had only 22% of the pregnant women completing four ANC, only 41% delivered at a health facility, and only 43% accessed PNC services within three days after delivery. So uh, that prompted us to, to partner up with uh, the Department of Health for Nakuru County to implement uh, a rapid result initiative. We called this uh, rapid result initiative surge. And we started by implementing in 29 health facilities in Kuresoi North and Kuresoi South sub-counties. So uh, in this implementation, we, are, we adopted the use of DHIS2 data capture app so that you can be provided with timely data to generate reports that would then be used for collaborative implementation, progress reviews, and uh, decision making. So this is uh, how uh, the system architecture looks like. So we provided healthcare workers with mobile phones uh, these are Android-based uh, mobile phones, and uh, we installed DHIS2 data capture app. 
within um, the, the mobile uh, phones so that the healthcare workers can use it to, uh, to submit data to us. So the kind of data that um, we were collecting, let me just go back to the first screen. So we were collecting, okay, it's not showing all of them, but for each and every facility, they were submitting to us the number of uh, pregnant women who are, co uh, who are coming for first NC visits, the number who are completing four ANC visits, and uh, the number of pre pregnant women delivering at their facilities, and uh, the number of mothers who are accessing PNC services within three days after delivery. This data was transmitted over the internet to a centralized server also hosting DHIS2 system. So the data we, we managed to collect uh, with this system, we used it to generate Excel-based reports that we then uh, uh, transmitted, disseminated through WhatsApp groups that we created for each sub-county. And also they were used uh, by technical teams uh, during project technical review meetings. And we also used it during quarterly advisory meetings with the, with the regional teams. So the WhatsApp groups involved the, the health management teams at the county and sub-county levels, and, and also the project technical teams and the, the healthcare workers. So what we, well, the results we have received is uh, we've managed to have timely data for decision making. Uh, this process has also helped us to identify service delivery and uptake challenges in a timely manner and provide uh, resolutions. We've also been able to design uh, interventions towards service uh, uptake and also the interventions that we were already implementing, we were able to note implementation gaps and uh, it, helps, it helped us to increase the impact of our implementation. So because we were able to do these three things, we noted uh, an increase in, the, in maternal and newborn health service uptake. Um, uh, if we compare the period when we didn't implement this system and the period when we implemented this system, we noted a significant increase in the number of maternal and newborn health services uptake. So we are comparing the period October 2018 January 2019 and October 2019, January 2020. So between that period, uh, the number of pregnant women completing four NC visits increased from 1,440 to 1,998. The numbers delivering at a health facility increased from 2,399 to 2,815 and the number of infants receiving postpartum care within three days after delivery increased from 2,314 to 2,817. So because of the results, uh, the successful results we, we achieved, we scaled up the system to an additional 45 uh, surge health facilities across uh, Baringo County in the sub-counties where we are implementing. So these are the lessons um, that we were able to, that we noted. These are, these are the lessons. So we were able to shorten data submission period because, uh, because of the direct submission by healthcare workers. So there was no third party involved. We were receiving data directly from the healthcare workers. And then, uh, we were able to eliminate uh, printing of paper-based forms. We initially started by using paper-based forms and then we moved to the system. So through this process, we were able to eliminate that. And then we also realized efficient report generation through centralized data repository. That made it easy for us to automate uh, some reports. So we also experienced some challenges during the, the process of implementation. So one of the biggest challenges was staff turnover. This led, led to frequent trainings and mentorships because uh, what we realized was that staff whom we had trained on the system were transferred to other health facilities that didn't have the system and uh, other staff were brought into our health facilities. 
communities where we're supporting this system. So we had to train them so that they can uh, continue with the submission. We also noted poor network coverage in some of our implementation areas. So that uh, made it, uh, some healthcare workers had to move around the facility to find areas where there was net, stronger network or even move to other locations so that they could be able to submit uh, data. So we also had cases of phone loss and malfunctioning and uh, where we were not able to replace um, the phones or repair the phones, then we had disruption of data submission and for some facilities, that meant reverting back to the paper-based system. So thank you very much. I'll leave it there and see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Back to you, Marta. Thank you, Beatrice. That was a great presentation and very interesting project. We do have one, uh, one question. I'm going to read it for you. It says, what do the healthcare workers think of the system and if they can use it for other things apart from capturing data. I guess they mean maybe the device. That's what okay. the question. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, the healthcare workers really uh, were really receptive to the system and because uh, it, it uh, reduced the amount of work because initially they had to use the paper-based forms uh, and now when they're using the, the Android phones, they were really happy to, to have reduced kind of uh, effort uh, in data submission. And, and also, yes, uh, they are using the phones for other, other activities. Like um, for us, uh, we are really trying to increase uh, uptake of maternal and newborn health services. So you find that sometimes they use the phones to also do things like calling um, the, the pregnant mothers who are defaulting for uh, antenatal care services. And also in Kenya, we are running uh, health insurance for the mothers and they are using the phones to also enroll the mothers into, into the health in insurance schemes that has been rolled out in, in the country. So yes, they are finding more uses for the phone and they are also, and because of that, it, also motivating them to use the phone more. Okay, thank you. We are almost out of time, but there is one last question for Beatrice, um, which is about managing data confidentiality using WhatsApp. So I don't know if you were actually sending uh, patient data over WhatsApp, but the, that's, the, that's the question. And I think that would be the last one. Okay, so we were not sending patient data over WhatsApp. Over WhatsApp, we were just sending aggregated data because the, the data that is submitted to us by the healthcare workers is, uh, is purely aggregate data. So when we send through the WhatsApp, we're just sending simple Excel-based tables that are showing how many, uh, like for example, how many NC1, clients uh, they have seen at the health facility, their targets, and also the percentage that uh, they, they have achieved, and so that they can be able to see uh, how far they are in terms of uh, achieving their target. So we were not sending any patient level data. Okay, uh, thank you, Beatrice. We don't have more time for questions, so I'm gonna please ask all of you answering, uh, asking questions that we had, uh, we got some in the uh, now very last minute to please post them in the community. We can answer those generic, and I think Beatrice, you can also go there and answer the ones related to your project. So I'm gonna pass it over to to Mike to introduce us our next presenter. Thank you very much for the presentation and congratulations again on the great project and implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mata and everyone. Great. And then our uh, last country story for uh, this session is coming from uh, Ghana, from the Ghana Health Services. Uh, we have uh, a, a very large tracker implementation running there that Ghana Health Services has been responsible for. Kwame, who works within the PPME unit there, is going to share his screen with us and talk through some of the lessons they've learned over this last year. Uh, Kwame, are you able to share your screen?
in meanwhile we can thank you for the flexibility on presenting while you are traveling as we can see yes we know it was uh it was the health services activity this afternoon work to do but i appreciate you sharing your time with us Hello, Kwame. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So, okay, great. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's afternoon in Ghana. So, I will say good afternoon. Well, my name is Kwame with the Ghana Health Services, and I'm just going to walk you quickly through um, some of the use cases we have in Ghana for Tracker. So um, this is just a background. Um, Ghana has since 2011 used DHIS2 as a, a national data repository. So we use DHIS for all our aggregate reporting across all facilities in Ghana. And that has actually um, motivated us to now move into client-based um, data capturing in our, our facilities. Um, due to the scale, we are currently concentrating on um, specific programs and interventions. And then as we move on, we shall scale up to other areas. So um, basically, this is just uh, to highlight the areas we have um, rolled out a tracker for. So we have the Safe Motherhood, which looks at antenatal care, delivery, postnatal care. So we track mothers right from antenatal care through to delivery, through postnatal care. We pick these children and then also track them from zero to 59 months through the immunization schedule, as well as growth promotion. And then we are currently also tracking all our HIV clients, as well as TB clients. Um, we also have a, a very um, simple clinical tool, which is still developed with a tracker for very small facilities where the attendance is not so high. And then also we have a strategy known as CHIPS, which we, we use to manage um, our clients in communities. They're more like a community level um, facilities which help us to expand our reach and provide uh, health services to um, our clients at the community level. So we use the tracker to track the implementation process. Now for us, there are some broad areas which we think um, any country or organization who is interested in deploying the tracker should look at. And the first area is the design and the configuration. So we have hosting and security. Now we have real time versus secondary data entry. Um, you realize that it would have been appropriate if all facilities or all users could enter data real time. But due to a lot of challenges, um, internet connectivity, sometimes challenges with the devices and all that. We, you have to really evaluate how you can marry the two real-time versus secondary. Some facilities can do real-time, others cannot. So they might have to do secondary data entry. And then also the scale. You need to start small and then scale it up gradually because um, you don't have to create a situation where people become demotivated because the tracker has been rolled out uh, in a large scale and it's not really meeting the expectations of users. So you need to be a bit strategic in there. And then you need to have a very solid team to support the rollout of the tracker. And then also you should look at the Android versus the, the web. So depending on the environment. 
Wait, and so we had a, I mean, both Clayton and I and Paula, we had a good chat on Friday where we talked about some of the things also. Um, okay. there's an, uh, so we have assigned like a few issues now to, to Paolo. Um, but I, I think also like one thing we learned today is like we need filtering by name for view and schema. I think just just so we can make the new UI work, right? I mean, the, the, the basic filtering for, for views, for instance, it would be nice to get that going. So, I, so maybe you can create a ticket there, uh, Luis, like for just like, at least have the same functionality that we have for pipelines for views, so we, so we can get the new UI working at least, even if it's an intermediary step, I think that would be nice. Uh, but in addition to that, like, if, right. and yeah, I have updated um, Jira. So if you look in Jira and just filter by um, assignee, you'll also see that. Well, okay. So let me quickly move to um, some of the challenges we we encountered. So we realized that limited coordination and analysis of data across programs was a challenge. So. What this means typically is that you have programs who have common data needs, but because there is no coordination, you realize that you'll be capturing the same set of data on the same individuals for multiple programs. And when that happens, it becomes a bit problematic. And then also um, lack of standard naming conventions. So each program comes with its own naming convention. So sometimes even though you have the same set of data, you have multiple naming conventions for, for these um, data elements. And it becomes, again, very difficult to get the users to appreciate what exactly you need them to capture. Now, legacy configurations and excessive data collection. In Ghana, for instance, um, specifically with HIV, we had a, a legacy system which was being used and we had to decommission and migrate onto the DHIS2 tracker. But then in migration, we realized that the legal system was capturing so much data, which was not really needed for um, the current program. So we had to do a lot of um, cleanup to, and then we adopted only what was very key. Now device procurement and management, I'm sure there's going to be a common problem. Um, most often it's difficult to get governments to support procurement of devices, especially in such an extensive scale. So it is also another um, challenge, internet connectivity, and then running different versions of DHIS for different implementations. So yes, we might have a version, a specific version for HIV, another version for um, maternal and child health, and then another version for other um, use cases. So sometimes managing all these different versions at the same time by the same team becomes a bit of a problem. And then having a dedicated team for training and support for various implementations. So that is also key. Um, you need to have a, a defined team whose task is it, it is to, whose task it will be to just maintain and respond to issues as and when they arise from end users. Because prompt response, of course, will also go a long way to help in the success of the implementation. And then there is this very important um, challenge, unique <laughs> identification. Um, Ghana, fortunately for us, the government is currently rolling out an extensive um, national identification program. So um, we are hoping that once that is completed, we can adopt the identification, the, the unique identification for our clients. But currently we are trying to manage um, the situation. We are using some improvised ways to um, uniquely identify our clients. It comes with its own challenges though. Now, what are our successes? Um, we have successfully been able to roll out the maternal and child health tracker in five out of 16 regions. And we are doing that progressively because we did not have enough um, resources to procure tablets and then do extensive training across the country. So as and when we get um, funding and devices, we target um, regions who are ready and then we deploy. Then we have also successfully um, rolled out the ART tracker in all ART sites across the country. We have done same for the TB tracker for all TB building districts. 
And then currently, we have been also able to generate all summary reports and key indicators for all the interventions. And then service providers are able to easily schedule appointments and also track missed appointments using the tracker. Now, um, these are some of the lessons learned. Um, we believe that you have to critically evaluate what level of health service you can use the tracker um, um, system because it is very, very important. Um, for us, um, our evaluation uh, helped us really to identify where exactly the tracker could work. So we targeted the programs, we targeted the smaller facilities where you don't have a lot of procedures. I mean, the, in a very small facility, the client comes, it is only one person who serves as the uh, records officer, as the clinician and as service. So everything happens around one desk. So it is very, very easy to drop just two tablets to help, you know, capture client data, either in real time or even um, on secondary basis. And then also you need to build trust in the tracker to avoid nervousness of data ownership and privacy. Um, once you move into the domain of um, individual data, client-based data, the issues of privacy comes up and ownership of the information comes up. So you need to also have a very good strategy to win the trust of the service providers and even to some extent the clients so that um, they can be comfortable with whatever you are going, you are doing with them. Now create standard operating procedures to ensure appropriate access to data system. So for us, what we did was that for each implementation, we had a standard operating system, which clearly spells out the meaning, the definitions, the rationale of everything we are capturing and even how to go about it and even the period at which that data needs to be collected. So all those things were spelled out clearly. So it um, gave us the opportunity to have a very common language across all facilities. So they all comply and work with the same set of rules. Now adopt secondary data entry instead of real time at the early stages of implementation to avoid data loss. Now, here we are looking at a situation where you set up your tracker after the trainings, you just ask the facilities to do away with all paper-based systems. We strongly think that if you pick such an approach, you are likely to have problems because even after training, uh, it takes time for the end users to get their hands wrapped around the system. So it is always good to run the two systems, the paper-based system first as a primary, and then the tracker as a secondary for a while until such a time where the users are very comfortable, then you can take a decision on whether to switch entirely to real time. Now, we also believe that you start small and build capacity over time. You configure all required aggregated reports to prevent manual collation and also to serve as motivation to service providers. Well, um, because you'll be running the paper-based and uh, electronic system concurrently at the initial stages. We strongly advise that as much as possible, you try to generate all the, uh, or automate the generation of all the service reports to make it easier for them. Else they will have to collect reports manually whilst they still do the double entries into the manual system and then the electronic system. And we think that is also um, a bit demotivational for the end users. And then finally, you need to understand from the very beginning that it is not cheap to run the tracker, especially if you, if you intend to run it on a large scale, just as we are attempting to do in Ghana, because it involves a lot of um, heavy procurement. You need to procure so many gadgets. You need to have extensive trainings across the country. And all these things have come with very huge costs. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. That was great. And uh, it's a wealth of experience from Ghana that's been uh, scaling up over the last couple of years to get to this point. We unfortunately don't have a lot of time left for questions, but maybe I can ask one that came up uh, in the previous uh, presentation as well, which was, how Ghana is managing what your, your final point there about data bundles, uh, covering the cost of devices, replacing devices. If you could just say a word about the, the financing of uh, those devices. 
Okay. So um, what we're currently doing is this. Um, with the procurement of the devices, we fall mainly on the support from partners to procure the devices. We've had um, um, global fund supporters with devices. We've had other partners, um, UNICEF, other partners provide um, supporters with devices. Now with the issue of bundle, what we have done is this. Um, we realized that it would be very difficult to get um, support from partners to provide bundle for the facility. So we've made it a policy that the facilities will use their internally generated funds to support the procurement of bundle for the system. Now, where there are smaller communities, uh, smaller facilities, we have uh, bigger facilities which play oversight role over these small facilities. So if the smaller facilities are not able to generate enough resources, the bigger facilities come in to support them with some funding to be able to procure the, the bundles. So currently that is the strategy we have adopted. Great, thank you. And I, I think we unfortunately don't have more time. We need to give time for the, the next session. Just to say a number of the questions that were posted have been moved over to the community of practice. Please continue the conversation over there. We, we aren't closing those threads at the end of the session. They'll continue throughout the week um, and even longer if uh, needed. Um, the only other thing I would mention before turning it over to Max is that there are the expert lounge sessions. There's one uh, starting just now um, that is looking at indicators. Uh, there are a couple of more around Tracker and Android in the next few days. Please take a look at your schedules.